In this video, we're going to talk about how reflections affect the sound of a sound source, like a speaker, at a given listening position. But before we do that, we'll just do a quick review. What you're looking at now is a sound source, and I've indicated that with a black dot, and a listener, or a microphone, and that's the red dot, surrounded in infinite space with a bunch of air molecules, and those are the little blue dots. The sound source makes a sound, and so what that means is that it's changing the air pressure over time. So it emits a high pressure, it compresses the molecules closer together, and then it comes back and emits a low pressure, so it stretches the molecules further apart, and then it goes back and does it again. As it's doing that, the wave goes out into space the same way that the ripples go out on the surface of a pond when you throw a rock in there. And that wave has a speed of its own, the speed of sound in air. And if we measure from one high pressure point to the next high pressure point, what we can find is the wavelength of the sine tone or the wave that we're putting out in the air that it's traveling in. So that wavelength is a function of how fast the wave is traveling in air and the frequency or the number of times per second that the sound source is repeating itself. If we think about this happening in one second, then the distance that the sound travels in air in one second contains all of the periods of the wave or all of the re repetitions of the wave that happened in that second. So the wavelength can be calculated by dividing the speed of sound in air by the frequency. So for example, if the speed of sound in air is 344 meters per second, and we're putting out a sound that has a frequency of 344 hertz, or 344 cycles per second, then we have a wavelength of one meter. So we can see here that the sound source is omnidirectional, meaning that it's sending sound in all directions perfectly equally. And what we're looking at in the top right-hand corner is a graph of the change in pressure over time at the listening position, at the red dot on the screen. What you can see as well is that I'm not really doing a, uh, an accurate simulation of real life. It's uh, more like an artist's representation. The way you can see that is that the pressure wave that I'm sending out doesn't diminish over distance. So it's not getting quieter and quieter as the wave gets further and further away from the sound source. The reason I'm doing that is that it basically just makes it easier to see in this animation. We're not trying to look at what happens in real life here. I'm just trying to give you an intuitive understanding of what happens when a sound reflects off a wall that's close by. So now I'm showing exactly the same thing again. The only difference is that I'm highlighting the high pressure wave with red circles and the low pressure wave with a black circle. And that's just to make it easier to see it as it goes by. So you get a better view of how the molecules are compressed and refracted as the wave goes out. Now we're looking at exactly the same thing, but I've multiplied the frequency by two. So there are twice as many waves per second coming out of that sound source. What that means is that the wavelength is now half as long. As we increase the frequency, we decrease the wavelength. And that's because the speed of sound doesn't change regardless of the frequency that we're looking at. This is an important thing to understand intuitively as we go further on in this video. So now I've divided infinite space in half by putting up an infinitely thick, infinitely long wall that uh, it extends upwards and downwards forever. I've also made sure that the sound source is half of a wavelength away from that wall. So it doesn't matter what the distance is, it's more a question of how that distance relates to the frequency that we're about to start playing from the sound source. What you can see now is that the sound source produces a high pressure wave and that goes out in all directions. And part of that reflects off the wall and starts coming back. When it arrives back at the sound source, that's when we're starting to make the second high pressure wave. So those two waves, the one that reflected and the new one that we're making now, are trying to both create a high pressure and they're both headed in the same direction, at least with respect to the listening position. So we can see at the listening position that that first high pressure wave comes in and then the second wave is actually twice as loud. Remember that I'm not simulating real life here. I'm not accounting for how much the level will drop with distance. So what we can see is that we get twice as much pressure, so twice as loud, on the second wave because what we're listening to now is the second wave directly from the sound source 
and the first wave reflected off the wall that's come back at us. And from now on, as we go in time, we will keep getting twice the pressure because we're always getting the current wave from the sound source and the previous wave from the reflection, and that will just keep going. In essence, this is the same as if there were no wall there and I were to have two sources. So if we think of the wall as a mirror, and I'll draw that as a mirror in space, then there's another sound source, another loudspeaker, let's say, on the other side of that mirror. And if those two loudspeakers put out exactly the same sound at exactly the same time, then the effect at the listening position is the same as if we had a perfect reflection coming from some point in between those two sources. So what happens if we change the distance between the sound source and the wall, but keep the frequency the same? What I've done here is I've moved the sound source to one quarter of a wavelength away from the wall. So it's half the distance it was at before. Now you can see what happens is that the high pressure wave goes out and it bounces back and gets back earlier than it did before. In fact, it gets back so early now that it arrives back at the sound source at the same time that we're trying to put out a low pressure wave. So the high pressure wave from the reflection and the low pressure wave that we're currently emitting meet each other. They cancel each other out and at the listening position, there's no sound. Those air molecules aren't moving at all. Let's now move the sound source further from the wall than where we started. So now I've moved out to three quarters of a wavelength away from the wall. And we can see now what's happening is that I send out a high pressure and then it goes out and reflects off the wall and comes back. And that takes some time. While that's happening, my sound source is putting out a high pressure, a low pressure, a high pressure, and the next low pressure. And the first high pressure that reflected off the wall meets the second low pressure that we're emitting right now from the sound source, and they start canceling each other again. So in the long run, this is exactly the same at the listening position as being one quarter of a wavelength away from the wall. But the difference is, as you can see in the top right-hand graph, that you get a little bit of the beginning of the wave. You get more of the beginning of the wave because it takes longer for the reflection to cancel the wave that's coming off the, the sound source at the listening position. So now the question is, does this happen in real life? It all looks very clean on a simulation that isn't really even a physical model of real life. So what we'll do now is move into a real room with a real speaker and see if we get the same effect or even something that vaguely resembles it. So we saw in the simulation that if you have an omnidirectional source and a perfectly reflective surface in infinite space, then the source and the reflection can interfere with each other out in this side of the world so that it'll either make the source louder or quieter depending on what frequency you're playing, how far away the source is from the reflective surface, and what angle or what direction the listener is sitting in. Let's now see if this is true in real life. What I have here is an omnidirectional source. This is a 13-inch woofer in, a, in an enclosed cabinet, and I'll use it on its back. So now it's omnidirectional, at least in the horizontal plane, at the frequencies that we're working in. This is on wheels, so I can move it, and I'm going to play a sine tone out of it. We're in a very big room. This is about 35 meters by 47 meters by about seven and a half, eight meters high, so it's quite big. It's a bit reverberant, but that doesn't matter for the purposes of this experiment. We've got a brick wall here, so for our purposes, that's perfectly reflective. And we're gonna be using this microphone, so this one right here, and that's what you're listening to right now. That's being recorded by another computer that I'll sync up with the video later. And you can also see the sound pressure on the sound pressure level meter right next to the microphone. So you can not only hear how loud things are, but you can see how loud they are as well, just in case you're listening over headphones or over speakers that can't reproduce the low frequencies that I'm about to make here. So I'm going to go play a sine tone. We'll start at 55 hertz, and we're going to move the speaker. We're not going to change the level. We're not going to change the mic position. All I'll do is move the speaker relative to the reflective surface, and we'll see what happens over here at the position of the microphone. 
So what you can probably hear and see on the SPL meter is that at this position, we're about six decibels louder than we are back here at this position. It shouldn't come as a surprise that it's getting quieter as I go further away, but what may come as a surprise is that because the reflection from the wall is cancelling the sound now, as I get closer to the wall, the sound will get louder. So I'm going further away, but the sound gets louder. And if I get very close to the wall, then it gets as loud as it'll be. So that's at 55 hertz, and that dip in level that you hear right now is true down this entire direction. So regardless of how far away the microphone was, you would hear that change in level here, loud, quiet, loud, it would just have a different direct to reverberant ratio. So you'd hear less direct sound and more reverb if you were further away. Let's now change to a different frequency. Now the sound pressure level has gone up because we're using a lower frequency and therefore we have to be further away to cancel it. I'll move the speaker a little bit further from the wall. And you should get the maximum cancellation here. So this is the dip in level. And as I get closer, it'll get louder. I'll come back to the point where it cancels best. And as I get closer to the wall, so further away from the microphone, it'll get louder again. Now, keep in mind that we're only doing two frequencies here, and you can see that I've put some marks on the floor so that I know where I'm going to be to get the, the maximum cancellation for a given frequency. If I change the frequency, then these distances will change. If I change how reflective the wall is, then this effect will change. If this was a, a drywall, for example, on studs, then the wall itself would be moving now, and we would get more absorption on the wall, so this may not work as well if that wasn't a concrete wall. The other thing to remember here is that if I have a 43 hertz tone, this is the point where it cancels best. If I have a 55 hertz tone, this is the point where it cancels best. If I want to hear both of those frequencies equally, then I'm going to have to do something. So I can split the difference and hope for the best, but now I'm canceling at another frequency. I could try to change the levels of these frequencies, but we have to keep in mind that the reason it's quieter there is because this speaker is cancelling itself off the reflection. So if I turn up the speaker at this frequency, at this frequency, then it will be louder there, but I'm also cancelling more. So I'm sending a lot of energy into the speaker only to have it cancel itself at the listening position. So that might not be the best way to fix this problem. The last thing we have to remember here is that this is a, a very theoretical situation, you could say. We have a very big space and we have one reflective wall. This effect happens in real life in normal rooms, but it doesn't just happen with a single wall. It happens with other walls and there are other things going on that also affect the sound. The reason I'm doing this is to just isolate this one effect so that you can see and hear what the effect is of that reflection on one frequency if your source is omnidirectional. The important thing to remember about this video is that the reason this works is that the waves that I'm producing, the sound that I'm making out of that speaker, are periodic, meaning they repeat themselves, and they're symmetrical, meaning the shape of the high pressure going wave is identical to the shape of the low pressure wave. It doesn't have to be a sine tone. This is an example of a case that isn't a sine tone, but it is periodic and it is symmetrical. So the reflection in this case will cancel this wave out at the listening position, regardless of its shape. However, this is an example of a wave that is periodic. It repeats itself, more or less. There's some noise in this signal, but it is not 
symmetrical. So even if I have the delayed signal at the right time, you can see that the positive going wave is not the same shape as the negative going wave. So if I add those two together, they don't cancel themselves out and go to zero. So I will get some sound at the listening position regardless of the time alignment of this signal with itself.